seven on the website. So. Well, that's it. Or maybe two. Yeah, that's fine. It can be plain. It can be ruled. It'll be fine. It doesn't matter. So, okay. Good morning, everybody. Let's uh, do some announcements here before we get started. All right. So today, um, this will be an anomalous class in the sense that there'll be a bit more of me talking than usual. Uh, so I'm Professor Stephen Sakula, and again, I'm really sorry that I wasn't able to be here on Tuesday. I spent two days at an international conference on supersymmetry and unified interactions, which I'm an organizer for. Uh, so I flew back yesterday morning, I got up at 4 in the morning, got on a 6 a.m. flight, got back here at 2 p.m., and then had a bunch of stuff to do for the afternoon. Uh, so I'm very pleased to be able to work with you this semester on electricity and magnetism and all the related stuff that goes with it. And today what we're going to do is we're going to play around a little bit with electricity. And then we're going to, I hope we'll have enough time to do this, I kind of want to step through it methodically. We'll uh, learn to set up and solve problems involving electric charge, electric charges, and uh, the interactions between them. So Coulomb's law, which is a mathematical explanation for an observed phenomenon, and we will observe that phenomenon today. Okay, so a few things. So for today, you had to basically read uh, chapter 21, all right? And there was no assigned lecture video for today. Um, the stuff that would have been in the video, I prefer to do in class so we can all kind of get to know each other, okay? Uh, the next assignment, you're going to read chapter 22.1 and 22.2, and there's an accompanying video to watch with that. Now, these videos are, you know, they can be between like 30 and 60 minutes. It depends on the subject material. But the good news is you don't have to sit there and watch it all in one sitting. You could watch 15 minutes of it, go get something to eat, watch 15 more, whatever. You can procrastinate at your leisure as long as you're prepared when you come to class because eventually you'll have to answer questions about the reading and maybe things that were presented in the lecture video. They're not going to be nitpicky things like at minute 32, what adverb did I use? And it's not going to be something like that, okay? So, you know, I want you to understand concepts. And I want you to pay attention to the demonstrations or uh, simulations that are done in the lecture videos. There may be questions on those uh, and so forth. It's to your benefit to pay some attention. Take notes. All right, so treat the lecture videos like you would falling asleep in my lecture class. Take notes, okay? Pretend to listen. Uh, go back and review your notes before the, the quiz, okay? Uh, homework one has been assigned. It's been available since about 8 a.m. this morning. It's assigned mostly through Wiley Plus. However, uh, there is a written question that I generated myself as an add-on to the Wiley Plus assignment. It's part of your homework assignment. If you go to the website, which I'll, I'll show you in a second, you'll, you can get this electronically from the website or you can grab a copy before you leave today. Many of you already have it if you don't grab a copy before you go. All right, so there's a Wiley Plus. Um, most of it's Wiley Plus. Some of it is this handout problem. Uh, the numerical answers to the Wiley Plus problems, they go into Wiley Plus, okay? And that'll be about half your homework grade for the assignment. The other half of your homework grade will be based on the written set of solutions you generate for all of these problems, Wiley Plus and the handout problem. Label them, order them, write all your work, show your steps, explain what you did, staple it together, put your name on it, hand it in next Thursday. Uh, I will give those solutions to the teaching assistant, Noosh, and she will pick randomly one problem to grade from the pile, okay? So it's, you have to make sure you do work for everything because you don't know which of those problems is going to be assessed on methodology. You are not assessed on your correct numerical answer. That's what Wiley Plus does. You're assessed on all the other stuff that goes into a solution. What was your thought process? Did you explain yourself well enough? Did you write all the steps down? Can I read your handwriting? Okay, if not, we'll work on that through the semester. Okay, there are ways. You could even type up homework if you wanted to. If you don't like your own handwriting, you're free to type up homework if you know how to write equations in a program. Okay? So, any questions on those things? Okay, so let me show you the, uh, the course website really fast here. Uh, get rid of that. All right, so hopefully you've all visited this or will visit it sometime today. This is the class materials site, all right? So when you go to the main course website, which is here, all right, you click on class material, and that will take you to this sort of semi-self-updating page, which slowly rolls out material, lecture slides, lecture notes, handouts, homeworks, and things like that. So past lectures are grayed out. The current lecture, sort of within 24-hour window, is in green. And you'll see today assignment due was homework zero, the math homework, which goes on the corner there. The solutions will eventually be posted. They're not there right now. 
And the assigned homework is homework one. So this is a PDF uh, uh, copy of what's in Wiley Plus. Now the numbers in this will be different than the numbers you get in your assigned version. So don't use the numbers from this to answer the question. This is just in case you, 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 know, you don't have a Wiley Plus account yet and you want to get started. I'll talk about that in a moment, okay? You have a reading assignment for next class, as I said, and there's the link to the video assignment. The reading and the videos are already pre-assigned. They're already all here. So you can skip ahead if you want. Uh, it's up to you, all right? If you want to get ahead of things, that's your business. All right, any questions on that? No? All right. Quiz time. All right, so go ahead and put your books, notebooks, all that stuff away. Please don't start quite yet when I hand this out to you. I know it's too silent. And just for your benefit, let's uh, let's take a look at the answers to the quiz. Oh, yeah, thank you very much. Let's take a look at the answers to the quiz questions. Okay. So, question one. All right, which of these is false about electric charge? So one, there is a smallest absolute unit of electric charge, which is called the elementary charge, and has the value of this thing. Is that true or false? True. True. Okay. There are two kinds of electric charge, positive and negative. True or false? True. True, okay. Electric charges exert forces on one another and point charge forces are governed by Coulomb's law. True or false? True. True, okay. It is not conserved, that is charge is not conserved, that is it is possible to create or destroy charge and thus change the total value of charge in a closed system. True or false? False. False, okay, yeah. So if you said false to the last one, that's correct. As far as we have observed, it's not possible to just make arbitrarily or destroy arbitrarily charge. You usually have to destroy it in pairs. Like you can take a plus charge and a minus charge and you know add them up to get zero charge. That's one way you can get rid of it, but you have to get rid of two. You can't just take plus charges and magically annihilate them without some cost. Um, of course, you can, if the system's open, if things can go in and out of the system, it can look like charge is not conserved. All right, but we've never observed that this happens. So as far as we know, charge is conserved Charges exert forces on one another, and point charges are governed by Coulomb's law. There appear to be two kinds of electric charge in nature. We call them positive and negative. Those are just labels. And there is a smallest absolute value of electric charge, which is called the elementary charge, and corresponds to the magnitude of a charge of an electron or a proton. Okay, question two. Which of these is a true statement about the electric force as described by Coulomb's law? Is it one, the electric force increases in strength as one increases the separation distance between two point charges? Anybody for one, raise your hand. Okay. Uh, two, the electric force decreases in strength as one increases the separation distance between two point charges. Any takers for two? Okay, lots of takers. Three, the electric force between two like sign charges is attractive. So two like sign or same sign charges will attract each other. Okay, no one. And finally, four, the electric force between two opposite sign charges is repulsive. So two opposite or non-same sign charges, they, they repel each other, no? Okay, good, yeah, so the correct answer is two to that one. The electric force falls off in strength as the distance between charges increases. There are actually, there's at least one force in nature where that's not true. If you guys wanna know more about that at the end of the semester under special topics, we can talk, okay? Boop. All right, well, you know the answer to that one. I might as well just let that one go. Which of the following are, actually, this is incorrect anyway, right? Uh, which of the following are true about the kinds of materials in which charges can be placed? Uh, the correct answers, it turns out, are two and three. So that was my mistake. I only meant one of those to be correct. Insulators do completely or almost completely prevent the free movement of electric charge. We'll actually play with insulators today. And conductors allow for almost perfectly free movement of electric charges. We'll play with conductors today, too. Okay, so both of those, two and three, and I'll, I'll fix that in the slides. Okay, bonus question. So which of, these true, which of these is true about this course? According to the syllabus, attendance during the class period is not assessed and doesn't count toward the final grade. Anyone for one? Is that true? Okay, two, according to the homework policy, all final answers to homework problems must be boxed, have appropriate units, and adhere to the rules of significant figures. Anyone for two? Okay, a few takers. Many takers. According to the homework policy, I have to work completely alone, conferring with none of my peers in the course about problem solving. Is three true? No? All right. According to the grand challenge problem policy, my grade on this project will only be determined using questions on the final exam. So only questions on the final exam will determine your grade. Okay, good. Yeah. So the correct answer is two. Box your answers, sig figs, and uh, make sure you have units on numbers where they're appropriate. Okay. So if there are no units, if it's a dimensionless quantity, that is, it has no units. 
uh, then don't write units down. Okay? But you can work together as long as you acknowledge each other's collaborations. So put the name of your collaborators at the top of your written homework solutions. Um, your grade on the homework challenge problem, uh, the grand challenge problem is a combination of a group grade and an individual grade. We'll, we'll, do, we'll do the team building for that next week. And according to the syllabus, uh, I do assess your attendance. You just had it assessed. It was the quiz. Okay. Okay, so let's get into solving problems using Coulomb's law, which really is just about exploring and then describing the electric phenomenon. Okay, so we're going to play with the electric phenomenon today. And I want to start by reminding you of something I think you should know, or I think you do already know, but, but I really want to drive it home. And that is the atomic theory of matter. Okay, so how many of you have heard of the atomic theory of matter? One of you have heard of the atomic theory of matter? How many of you have taken chemistry? Raise your hand if you've taken chemistry. Okay, then you've all used the atomic theory of matter. What, what do you do in chemistry? What are you studying in chemistry? Atoms. Atoms, okay. And the premise is that everything around us is made from building blocks called atoms. And the only thing that distinguishes atoms from one another are the number of electrons, well, the number of protons that they have determines the kind of atom, and the number of electrons determines their chemical properties. So if they have exactly the same number of electrons as protons, they're electrically neutral. But some of those electrons are weakly bound on the outermost orbits of the atom, and that can facilitate bonding with other kinds of atoms. If you ionize an atom, if you intentionally remove or add electrons to it, uh, that can also give it different chemical properties than it would have in its neutral state. So the atomic theory of matter is nothing more than the statement that everything around us is made of building blocks, and if we could figure out what those building blocks are and how they stick together, like Legos, we could figure out how the world works. All right? Does anyone know when the atomic theory of matter was definitively demonstrated to be the correct description of nature? Any guesses, or do you know the date, roughly? Take a guess. A Adam, is that your name? Yeah. Yeah, Adam. So when, when do you think it, uh, it was? 1850. 1850, all right. So 1800s, all right? Any takers for earlier than the 1800s that we knew about the atomic theory of matter, at least that was solid by, by the 1800s. Yeah? Tentative hand? So. What? Okay, what's your name? Shannon. Shannon, okay. So 1600s. Anyone for after the 1800s? Okay, so everyone thinks it was settled by the 1800s? Yeah? It was actually about 1905 <laughs> that it was definitively really taken seriously. And does anybody know who sealed the deal on the atomic theory of matter as a description of nature that was correct? Does the name Albert Einstein ring any bells? No? Yeah? Crazy hair, old guy with the mustache? Yeah? Okay. Yeah, believe it or not, so when he was a young, just postgraduate school, he couldn't get a job because he was kind of a jerk to everybody that he worked with. So he had a hard time getting a faculty position. And he took a job as a patent clerk and finished up work he had started while he was a graduate student getting his PhD. And one of the papers he published in 1905, which is referred to as his miracle year, he published something like four or five papers that year. Uh, one of them showed that something called Brownian motion, which if you, if you look under a microscope at a fluid that's got little dust particles in it, you'll see the little dust particles jiggling around, even though there's nothing around them that seems to be hitting them. And the explanation for that was only successfully done with the atomic hypothesis. That is, the water is made of atoms, molecules. Those molecules are in thermal motion. They're bouncing off each other and jiggling around. And so anything that's implanted in the water will get nudged by these little water molecules that are around it and kind of jiggle around like, you know, Captain Jack Sparrow in Pirates of the Caribbean or something like that. A random motion thing that he does, all right? <laughs> No, I, is that movie too old for you guys? Is that? Is that <laughs> I've lived many a decade. I see all kinds of nonsense. All right. So you know, we look at solid objects at the macroscopic level. The macroscopic level is our level. You know, roughly meter sized. Okay, and they look continuous to us. But we know that if you keep zooming in on materials, eventually what you find out is that way down inside those glass tubes I just showed you are silicon atoms, for instance. So silicon dioxide. Okay, so here are some silicon atoms that form what's called a crystal lattice. That's just a regular arrangement of silicon. These little blue blurs here, those are the silicon atoms. And this is actually an image of silicon atoms in a crystal using a scanning tunneling microscope. So this is about as close to seeing atoms as you'll ever get. And that's about the best picture of an atom anybody can take. It's blurry, and it's not blurry because the camera's not very good. Okay, it's not blurry for the same reason your iPhone doesn't take good pictures. 
It's blurry because when you get down to sizes this small, there is no exact sense of where something is and where it is not. It's all waves. It's all probabilities. There's a chance that an electron is here. There's more of a chance it's here, and there's less of a chance it's over there. So nature has a blur built into it, and that's what you're seeing. The atoms can't be exactly localized. I mean, you can kind of see, well, that atom is mostly right there, and it's not over here in this void. It's not here in that void. But there's a non-zero chance of finding it in that void. It's just small compared to the chance of seeing it here in its sort of bonded lattice position. So this is about the best image of atoms you can make because nature has a built-in limit to how well you can resolve things. Now, there are lots of cartoon pictures of atoms. Atoms, again, are these little building blocks. The way they bond together def defines the structure of materials. Okay, so, you know, why gold is gold colored, why copper is copper colored, why silver is sort of a, a lighter white gray color, all of that is determined by the properties of the atoms. And if you understand those properties at the level of physics, you can predict the behavior of new materials. Okay? So these are the popular cartoons for demonstrating what atoms look like. There's a hydrogen atom. It's got one electron and one proton. Uh, here's a helium atom. It's got two protons, two neutrons, and two electrons in its neutral state. Here's lithium. Here's neon. These are nice cartoons. They're also completely inaccurate. This makes the nucleus of the atom look like it's, you know, in this case, bigger than the electron and very close to it. And in fact, the size of a hydrogen atom, does anybody know what the orbital radius of a hydrogen atom is, just off the top of your head? I'll be impressed if somebody knows this. It's a good number to have in the back of your pocket. It comes in handy. It will come in handy in this course. We'll use it a few times at least. Okay? It's about 10 to the minus 10 meters, or one angstrom. Okay? 10 to the minus 10 meters, roughly. That's the radius of a hydrogen atom. Does anybody know what the size of the nucleus is? What's the size of a proton? Protons do have finite size. They're not point objects, but they're teeny tiny. For all intents and purposes, for us, they're points. Well, do you think it's about 10 to the 10? Anyone, anyone want to say it's about 10 to the 10? So it's about the size of an atom? Not based on what I just told you, right? Do you think it's, it's about like one-fifth the size of an atom? One-tenth the size of an atom? You're just shaking your head all the time. One millionth the size of an atom? No. OK. Are you going to go for a millionth? How about a thousandth the size of an atom? No? No takers? It's about, it's about a ten thousandth of the size of an atom. Or a hundred thousandth, sorry, a hundred thousandth the size of an atom. So 10 to the minus 15 meters is roughly the size of a proton. So protons are teeny, teeny, tiny compared to atoms. So these pictures are totally wrong. And in fact, if you were to look at an atom, as that last picture suggested, you wouldn't see this neat orderly arrangement of like planetary electrons orbiting a central uh, nucleus like it's a star in our solar system. This is actually more what a hydrogen atom looks like. So in its ground state, that's what a hydrogen atom looks like, perfectly spherically symmetric. That's just the probability of finding the electron somewhere, okay? So all that tells you is that there's a probability of finding the electron roughly uniformly around the center of the atom. And then you have other states that you can go into. You have uh, the excited states of the S wave, you have uh, P wave, you have D wave, and you see they start to, they're still symmetric, but they're not perfectly round symmetric anymore. And all of these are just the chances of finding the electron in different locations. So it's not, the picture of the atom is not of this orderly electron just cycling around the proton is wrong. Okay, the structure of the atom is actually very complicated, and it's understood only with physics. It's understood with something called quantum mechanics, which is not in this course, but it's, it underlies everything we do in this course. Okay. All right, so that's, that's sort of the atomic theory of, of nature. And one of the nice things about this picture is that you see is at the heart of everything that we have around us are electric charges. Electrons determine the chemical properties of atoms, and protons determine what kind of atom it is to begin with, and give you the mass of the atom for the most part. Protons are far heavier than electrons. So if you take the electrons off an atom, you change the mass by only about 1%. All right, so electrons contribute very little to the mass of an atom. It's really the protons and the neutrons, which nearly have the same mass, that do it. All right, neutrons come along for the ride. They're electrically neutral. They play a very important role in the atom, but we won't talk about it in this course. All right, but it's the protons that determine the atom type and the electrons that determine, determine its chemical bonding properties. It's all just charges, okay? So charge plays a really fundamental role in nature. How it was discovered is a long story, and we'll see snapshots of that story through the course. 
But today what I want you to do is just start playing around with electric charge a little bit. Just get a sense of, of what it means that there's this thing in nature called electric charge and it has effects on the world around it. Okay? So one of the things I want you to do is, um, you know, row by row, gather yourselves together. So move close together. Take your soda can, take your piece of paper, and take a wand. Okay. Uh, exactly. And, uh, well, you got the magic wand. Uh, oh, actually, okay, I already That's better. So, okay, so here's what you're gonna do. Here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna you're gonna take uh, you're gonna take this piece of paper. This is one kind of material, right? This is paper, and you're gonna take the wand I gave you. I think they're all some variant of plastic. All right, so they're all basically plastic, and you're gonna do something called the triboelectric effect. You're just gonna rub the wand with the paper. So you're gonna rub two dissimilar materials together. And then I want you to lay the can on its side so it can roll. And I want you to hold the wand next to the can and see what happens. So rub the materials really good. And then hold the wand next to the can and then see what happens. All right. I'll hold the Whoa. Let's try out a different one. There we go. Down. Good. Seems like it, right? Yeah. I feel like we just Yeah, it, it could be this, the surface area. Oh, not big enough to get enough charge, sort of. <laughs> You're doing it wrong here. <laughs> use that one. Use that one. It's got. It's that's going to be easier, I think. PVC is a much better plastic for this kind of stuff. Who's is defective? All right. All right. Is it? It was. It was. It was. Okay. Right. Yeah. So the like the pink Starbucks is not a good bag to use. Okay. It's something to figure it out, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's just trying to figure it out. I like rubbing it. Or maybe you're not good at this. Maybe you love something else. Maybe you suck at this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, who's that one broken? Uh, no? uh, no? uh, Yours? Okay. Uh, 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 yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> there you go. It's a trap. There you go. Oh. 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 Can I do it quickly to like make it charge? Or charge? What's that? Just squeeze and make it charge in there. Yeah. Okay. And then you know, let the let the, the the plastic rod actually make contact with the can, and then see if the force is still as strong after it touches the can. It takes some practice. You can also try getting one of the, these white uh, PVC pipes. Yeah. They, 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 they get better at soaking it's the pus. Yeah. 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 It's a pus. It's supposed to be like a really yeah. 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 Do you have damp hands? Yeah. yeah. Wow, okay. If, it, if oh, your body is sweaty, that can affect how much charge Long. builds up on the wand, too. So, so when you touch it, yeah, so trying to do some better than that. So when it touches, it's really bad for you. When it touches, it's yeah. supposed to like 39 yeah. 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 Well, well, you oh, tell me, yeah. what, what did you observe about the force after you yeah. let them come in contact? Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Do you have to get it closer to the can to get the acceleration to happen? <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, I've never seen that ever. So if you leave it on long enough, will it? No. Will it well, eventually. I mean, right now. Well, I'll talk about that in a moment. But what's going on? Even in the air right now, there's free water molecules, and water molecules are very greedy electrically, and so they'll soak up any net charge off the materials and carry it away. And we'll actually see a very dramatic demonstration of that later in the, in the course. But uh, water is a very greedy huh. substance. Actually, pure water is very dangerous. It's a it's a chemical hazard. You know, the water you drink out of the pipes is not pure. pure. Oh, it's mixed okay. with minerals and things like that, and that, that lowers its electrical affinity. But if you drink pure water, it leaches nutrients out of your body. It's actually a chemical hazard. So pure water is actually quite dangerous. If you dump it, OSHA will come after you. Right. So I once worked on an experiment that had an ultra-pure tank of water, and if it ever dumped, we had to report it to the EPA. Because it can damage the ecology of the, of the area. It's so electrically greedy that it can actually kill things. So. Yeah, everyone thinks water is this great thing, but water is horrible. Right? We're very lucky we get to utilize it for life, but it kind of sucks as things go. All right, so I'm gonna, can I steal the can? Wait, so when your hand touches the can, it's 
water takes away the charge. Yeah, yeah. So water, well, yeah, water has this ability to really soak up uh, charge. So let me, uh, let me uh, this here. And bring up. Oh yeah. The demo cam. All right. So you guys want to go back to your seats or, or whatever? That would be that would be fine. All right. Over here. Okay, so yeah, so you you know you get the idea here. I'll use some rabbit fur for this. I didn't want to make anybody use the dead rabbit for this because I feel guilty that we have this. Don't do anything stupid because you're on the screen. Yeah, try not to try not to look. What's your name, by the way? Zach. Zach. Yeah. Okay. Don't screw up, Zach. This is your moment. You're going to be on YouTube. All right. Come on, you're there. We go. All right, so. What's going on? Let's think about this from a physics one perspective. Okay, first semester perspective. What is the velocity of the can right now? Zero, okay. And what's, now what's the velocity of the can? Is it still zero? Okay, so what is a change in velocity signal? What's the name for a change in velocity over some unit of time? An acceleration, okay. And if you observe an acceleration in nature, what does it imply exists? A force, right? Exactly. So F equals MA. That is a universally, generically true law. If you observe a change in the state of velocity of a system, a force is being applied to it. It may have happened in the past, and now the velocity is just constant and continuing at a higher number or a lower number than when it started, but there was nonetheless a change in velocity in some unit of time, and that is an acceleration. And if you know the mass of the system whose state was changed, you can figure out the force. You can figure out its magnitude, and if you know the direction of the acceleration, then you know automatically the direction of the force. Okay, so if you know where this points, right, so if the can, let's see if I can get this to work. Put up a little charge. So if the can is moving this way, Where's the acceleration point? Yeah, this way, right? Because it was moving here, but the change in velocity was this way, so the acceleration must have been this way, all right? Whereas on this side, now the change in the acceleration, the change in the velocity is this way, so the acceleration must point this way, and so the force must point this way, okay? Is this gravity? How do I know it's not gravity? How do I know that this isn't explained just by gravity? What, what causes gravity? What's the source of the gravitational force? Well, Earth is an example of something with a lot of mass. Lot of mass. So mass is the origin of the gravitational force for all of you guys, that you, all you need to care about. That's the source of gravity. We know better now what causes gravity. If you see the movie Interstellar, you can see an example of a modern understanding of gravity and force. Okay. Um, how do I know it's not gravity? Well, let's say I just, so what I've done is I've kind of rubbed this plastic. This is an insulator. It can hold charge pretty well. It can hold it in place. It doesn't move. This is a metal. It's a conductor. It's very good at removing charge and letting it move freely through its body. Okay, so I can remove the charge and I can try to use the mass to attract the can. We're going to wait a long time for this to do anything. Okay, but if I just give that a little rub, Okay, it takes no effort to move this thing. All right, so what have I already observed about the gravitational force relative to this new phenomenon? This, let's call this the electrical force. Which one's stronger? Electrical. electrical force, yeah. That, without the charge on it, does squat. I throw a little bit of charge on this, easy, no problem, okay? And in fact, as we'll, we'll learn later, it's really important that the electrical force is stronger than the gravitational force. We um, kind of owe our existence to that, okay, in part. Okay, the electrical, whatever this phenomenon is, whatever I'm doing when I rub this material and then put it next to this thing, this is an insulator, we know now. This is a conductor. It's made of aluminum, metal, very good conductor. Let's charge move through it. Anybody have any ideas about, you know, let's imagine that there is something called electric charge for a second. So I built up a net charge on this thing, and then I put it next to this. I haven't put a charge on the can, right? I've never rubbed the can. So what's going on maybe? What do, what do you guys think is happening here that's causing a force? The can has a charge. Okay, can has a charge, but it's, okay, let's, let's check that out. Let's check out if that's true, okay? Throw me another can. Can you throw me that can, Sophie? I mean, I don't know if I can make it that far, 
Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, does the can have a charge? Apparently not. Okay. So it didn't gain a net charge in that process of being exposed to that. Okay. So what else might be going on? Any ideas? The can may be an acceptor to the charge. Meaning? Uh, Define what that means. Maybe negative in charge and that's positive, so it attracts each other. Okay, but then shouldn't something have happened when I put these, shouldn't it be repelling or attracting or something, right? Okay, so it does seem like the net charge of this thing really is zero. But what's true about a conductor? What can charges in a conductor do? Run freely. They can run freely. So let's say this is positive, okay? Are there negative charges in that material someplace? Where? In the electrons, yeah, well, everywhere, okay, yes, but specifically the electrons, right? And, the, and some of those electrons are free to move in a conductor. Even the, the outermost, you know, bounded electrons of aluminum atoms, they're not that strongly bounded. So if you give them a nudge, they'll take off, okay? So if I put a positive charge here, let's try that again. Thank you, water in the air, for ruining that. If I put a positive charge here, what do you think the electrons are doing in that can? Yeah, they're moving over here toward it. And what's happening then to the positive? What, where is there a positive charge then that builds up elsewhere in the can? On the, other side. On the other side, yeah. So what happens is that you get these electrons that race over here. They can't get off the metal, but they get as close as they can to this, and the can moves. Well, the electrons want to stay at that closest point, right? So they kind of slide back to that closest point, and the whole thing repeats again, and rolling happens, okay? So it's, it's like taking a string and, and wrapping it around the can and tugging on the top of the string to make it roll, except you don't need a string. You can do it at a distance with no physical contact whatsoever. And that's one of the really cool and useful things about the electrical force. Okay? And then to demonstrate that charge is a moving thing, okay, I've got here just a little soda can. I use this for another demonstration, but we'll use it for the tinsel that's on the front. So you'll notice there's a bunch of tinsel on the front. Right, tinsel is just little bits of mylar. It's little metal. It's uh, you know use it for like holiday decorations, right? So you can get this for like a buck. You can buy a ton of this for a dollar at Target. Okay, so I have lots of tinsel if anybody needs it. All right, so I've built up a net charge on this insulator. Watch what happens when I touch the the tinsel. All right, so I transferred some of the charge to the tinsel. But what I've done is uh, I've transferred. Uh, for instance, if this is a positive charge. Okay, then I just yanked a bunch of electrons off that tinsel. But there's no place for electrons to come in and replenish the ones that were lost there. It's sitting on a bunch of uh, styrofoam cups. That's an insulator. So there are electrons in the table, uh, but they're not free to move up through this insulator back into the can. All right, so I've created a net imbalance of charge by taking some of the electrons and putting them on this stick and removing them from there. So net charge between the stick and that system is still the same. I just moved it around. And now I've left a net positive charge on that tinsel. Well, the tinsel doesn't want to be near itself when it's all carrying the same charge on every arm, so it spreads out. Now, how might I remove that charge? I could put the stick back on. Yep, I could also just, I'm a conductor, all right? So I can touch the can. And now there's no charge left, and I can put charge back on. All right, so it's like a little fluid. You can just kind of move it around. It's like water. It's like pouring water from one container to another. You keep the total amount of water the same. You just move it around. And if you make water flow just right, what can you get out of it? What can you do with moving water that benefits society? Energy, yeah. Yeah, you can power things with a moving fluid. Well, if we could make electricity move, we could make electrons move at our will, we could do things with it. And lo, lo and behold, we've done that, right, as a society. All right, so we'll touch on all that as the semester goes on. The last thing I wanted to demonstrate is the uh, existence of two kinds of charge, okay? So what I'm going to do is, actually, I prefer the paper for this. The rabbit fur tends to come apart on me. Can I get a good piece of paper? Yeah, great, okay. All right, so let me get demo cam aimed up. There we go. Okay, so what I'm going to do, actually, I'll go over here because I need some conductors. So I'm going to remove the net charge from this. The earth is a greedy sink of charge. It's called ground for obvious reasons, okay? And so if you ever need to get rid of a net charge, just touch ground. Touch a piece of metal that connects somewhere like to plumbing, okay? And that, then the earth will soak up the excess charge for you. 
Um, you've done this before. You've all accidentally gone to ground before but after building up a net charge. Anybody have an experience with building up a net charge and then touching a piece of metal and going, ah! Yeah, yeah like in the winter when it's really dry, you, you're walking across carpet and you go and touch a doorknob and yeah. Okay, so that you've got a homework problem on that, actually. All right, so that's the extra problem I gave you guys. So I'm going to use the tribal electric effect, and I'm going to put a net charge on this thing. So this is just a little balanced PVC pipe. Okay. There we go. And then let me, uh, just so there's no funny business, remove all that charge. Okay, and then we'll cut this one. patient. I uh, should be able to affect this. All right, so these are same materials, and I rub them with the same other dissimilar material. So I've clearly built up one kind of charge on the system, and I can even slow this thing down, and I can reverse the direction of motion. So same charges repel each other. Okay, we saw that in the textbook, but here's a demonstration of it. So I've used two insulators to trap the same kind of electric charge, and I can make this thing move at my will. It's like using the force. This is great, right? I'm all prepped for the new Star Wars movie this December. I'm very excited about that. Okay, great. So that's, that's one thing you can do. And then, ah, here's the other one. What if you have a different material? So this is glass, okay? So this is just a glass tube, all right? And let me uh, drain that again. We'll put some more charge on this. All right, so now I've got paper on plastic, okay? And now I'm gonna do paper on glass. Okay, so when I did plastic against plastic, there was a repulsion. And now two different materials, paper and glass rubbed together, I appear to have gotten a different kind of electrical phenomenon built up on this. So now, see if I can get this to reverse. Slow it down. The acceleration is pointing that way, it, it appears. And without touching, this one appears to be attractive. All right? So whatever charge I built up on this, it appears to not be the same that was built up on the plastic by rubbing. So this is a simple demonstration that there are at least two kinds of charges in nature. We call them positive and negative. And uh, actually, does anybody know who is the person who assigned positive and negative charges based on materials being rubbed and so forth? Does anybody know the, the scientist that, uh, that's responsible for that? And as you'll see, to blame for all of our problems with labeling things and electricity later on. Is it like oh, something with an ohm? Something with a, like ohm? Is that what you're going? Like George Seymour George Ohm? No, nope, he did other stuff. Was it Edison? No. Nope. Earlier, Franklin? Did I hear Franklin? Yeah, Ben Franklin. Yeah, Franklin is the one that, uh, that assigned the positive and negative designation. Okay. All right. So um, that's just some nice demonstrations. But, of course, what you need to do is, uh, is you need to understand how to utilize a description of nature that captures everything we've just seen and lets you actually calculate the properties of the world and then test those calculations by doing more experiments, okay? And so, after a tremendous amount of work, there is a singular equation that describes the force exerted by the electrical phenomenon between two point charges, Q1 and Q2, all right? So Q will often be used to denote charge, and these are point or point-like charges, point-like charges, okay? What do I mean by point? I mean that the dimensions of the charge where it's encapsulated are smaller than other dimensions in the problem. So, you know, for all intents and purposes, this remote control is a point in this room, because this room is huge compared to this thing. So if I put a big charge on this, I could approximate this as a point charge as long as whatever else I bring near it isn't so close that the dimensions of this thing matter, okay? You know, that there's uh, a point over here and a flat side here. 
those dimensions could matter for the distribution of charge, but if I'm really far away from it, it won't, I won't be able to tell what its dimensions are anyway. All right, so for instance, the proton has dimensions. It's about 10 to the minus 15 meters in radius. But we're huge compared to that. So for all intents and purposes, protons look like points to us. Okay. To another proton, that may not be true. But to us, it is. All right, so Q1 and Q2 are charges. And we've seen that as we build up, you know, if you guys played around with the, the triboelectric effect a bit more, you'd observe that the more you rub, the more charge you transfer, the stronger the force would be on the can. All right, so that's a simple experiment you could do. You could try like, you know, one, two, and then try to attract the can, drain off the charge. One, two, three, four, so double the charge, and then try it again and see if the force go goes bigger or stays the same. You know, there's likely a saturation point. Plastic can only hold so much soaked up charge. But you could play around with like, you know, just rubbing a little bit, rubbing a lot, and see if you can build up more charge. And you should find that you get proportionally more force. Um, what we also find is that the distance between the two point charges affects the strength of the force. So the further apart the charges are, the weaker the force. And this, this uh, relationship goes what is said to be quadratically. That is, it goes as a square. Okay? So in this case, 1 over the distance squared. So R12 is the distance, okay, and it would be in meters, so in meters, M between Q1 and Q2. And I should say here that charge is in coulombs. Coulombs C. Okay? <coughs> and what we observed is that the force acts on a line connecting the two charged objects. You know, the, if, you, if you have a charge here and a charge here, like I did with the, the pendulum, this little torsion pendulum, so the spinny thing, okay? Um, when, I, when I put the, the other pipe next to it that was charged, it didn't lift the pipe up. It didn't push the pipe down. The force always acted on a line connecting the two of them. So I could either attract along that line or repel along that line, okay? So that little symbol over on the right, is a special thing. You're going to get to know and love these. It's called a unit vector. And it just indicates direction. Its job is purely to indicate direction. The length of a unit vector is always 1. That's what makes it a unit vector. So the unit in unit vector means length equals 1. So if anybody ever asks you what's the length of a unit vector, you say 1. one. Okay, wow, look at you, little sheeple. That's just oh, terrible. You're in college, think for yourselves. No. Come on. All right, so yeah, so that's a good thing to keep in mind. All right, unit vectors always have length one. I know that seems maybe trivial, but it's a really important thing, and it's just good to know it. It's good to have it in your heart and in your head, okay, because it will come in handy. You'll be able to save your bacon with that, that information. Um, when we talk about coordinate systems, okay, like a Cartesian coordinate system with an x-axis, and a y-axis, which you need to use to describe a situation. You always need to draw a coordinate axis, and I'll illustrate this in a, in a moment, okay? Uh, x direction, y direction, we have unit vectors that tell you how, you know, whether you're going in the x direction or whether you're going in the y direction. And those unit vectors are an i with a little hat over it for the x direction. So this, the i hat means moving in x direction. And then we have a J hat, which means moving in the Y direction. If I tell you the unit vector is negative I hat, what direction am I moving in? Left. Left. Yeah, so negative X direction. Okay? So directions, you know, they can be flipped. And if I say negative J hat, that's the negative Y direction. So unit vectors, they fulfill, in, in the world of vectors, okay, in the world of vectors. Let's say we have a vector V, okay, and it's got a magnitude that is a length, all right? So if V is a velocity, and somebody asks you, what's the magnitude of your velocity or your speed, you would give them a number, a pure number, something called a scalar, okay? So for instance, like five meters per second. 
But if I ask for velocity, I also want to know direction, right? Because it's important to know sometimes where you're headed, not just how fast you're going there. So for instance, it's also important to specify that you're doing five, mile, or five meters per second in the positive x direction, or i hat. So math is just a way of representing complex linguistic ideas in a simple notation. Math is the language of, that we use to describe nature, and it works ridiculously well. Okay? It's been developed over hundreds and hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. And uh, it's a very effective shorthand for saying very complicated things in a compact way. So it's just another language, okay? like English or French or Spanish. It's got its own symbology. It's got its own rules. But once you learn them, you can describe all kinds of crazy complex things in nature, including weird forces like this one. Okay? So this is the magnitude. <coughs> this is the direction. And vectors have both. right? I always think back to uh, Despicable Me, the villain vector. Right? His crimes have both direction and magnitude. Okay, so for me, that helps. I like that, okay? So if that helps you to remember it, so be it. But if you're asked for a vector, if I ask you for the force, I don't want just the strength of it, the magnitude of it. I want the direction of it as well. Okay, so that's a vector. It has a length and it has a direction. And some of them can be quite complicated. We could imagine another velocity that's 5 meters per second in the positive x direction, but it also has a 3 meter per second component in the negative y direction. That's also a vector. Okay? So that basically means that I go, every time, every time a second passes, I go 3 meters in the positive x direction. So let me see if I can do this here. Uh, no, 5 meters in the positive x direction. I'm not going to be able to make this work. Here, we'll, we'll go this way. We'll call this positive x. So I go 2, 3, 4, 5 meters. Okay? And then, uh, let's see, that was, this was positive x, so that's positive y. So I'm going to go, <laughs> great, I'm going to go 3 meters in the uh, positive y direction. Okay, I'm going to try to go through the wall, all right? That's all that means. It's just a way of representing, you know, you go one way and then you go the other, all at once. All right, so unit vectors play a really important role. They let you, in a compact way, describe direction uh, alongside magnitude. So. Another way to think about vectors is if, if you were going to a friend's house and you asked, well, how do I get to your house? I've never been there before. They might say to you something totally useless, like, oh, no problem. You go uh, 10 miles, and then you go 3 miles, and then you're there. That's useless directions, right? Because they didn't tell you anything about what direction. Do you go north and then east, or do you go south and then east? 10 and 5 what? So, Vectors, directions, are only useful if you specify both magnitude and direction. All right? So 10 miles north, 5 miles east, boom, you're there. No problem. All right? Punch it into Google Maps. All right, so, so that notation is something I'll use a lot. It combines both magnitude and direction information. And the direction is entirely encapsulated in whatever sign is in front of the unit vector and the unit vector itself. Okay, so that's negative y direction, and the other, one, the other one's a positive number, so that's positive x direction. All right, so any questions on, on that? All right, we're going to use this. We're going to use this and get some practice with this. Okay? Okay, so this is the form of Coulomb's law. It's got a constant out in front as well, uh, which I'll just write down here. This constant is not something that could be predicted. It had to be measured. All right, and it's just a number. It's a number that nature uses. It's an important number, but it's not obvious why at first. All right, so it's 8.99 times 10 to the ninth Newton meters squared per Coulomb squared. Since forces are measured in Newtons, all right, kilogram meter per second squared, and you've got Coulombs times Coulombs divided by distance, so meters squared, if you want to get newtons on the left-hand side, whatever that constant of nature is, its units have to be newtons times meters squared to cancel out the meters squared in the denominator, divided by coulomb squared to cancel out the coulomb squared in the numerator. All right, so that's where the units come from. It, it has to be just figured out by doing an experiment. Okay. Okay. So that's the constant k. Um, just because the book makes this point, and we will use it later. There's often another way of writing k, which is that it's equal to another number, 
epsilon, epsilon, N A U G T, naught. Epsilon sub zero, subscript zero is, we, physicists just call this epsilon naught. Okay, so epsilon naught is this thing. And you can figure out what it is by punching this equation into your calculator and solving for epsilon naught. But epsilon naught is 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12 Coulomb squared per Newton meter squared. It flips the units upside down, okay? Epsilon naught turns out to be the more fundamental constant of nature. Nobody knew what it was at the time. It was just something you measured and, and then you moved on with your life. But it turns out that number is extremely deep. It's embedded in the cosmos. And it's related to something ex even more fundamental in nature. But we'll get to that later. Okay? All right, so let's use this thing. Let's learn how to solve problems, set up and solve problems. So I'll use the remaining time to kind of get this moving. And then I, uh, I think we won't be able to get to your problem-solving exercise today. That's why I hate doing lectures, because it wastes your time, OK? Um, but I'll give you an example problem, and then you just, you'll do an extension of it. So you can practice this. The solutions will be posted on the website. So you can try it yourself, see how far you get, and then, uh, and then go from there, OK? I want to warn you, though, these problems that I cook up, I'm trying to make them relevant to you as non-physicists, all right? So I'm looking for physics. Physics is everywhere in the natural world, so I just try to pick it out of things like chemistry and biology and then use examples from those uh, to build up physics concepts. But I will warn you that, you know, this is what biology looks like to a biologist, right? You know, or at least an or ornithologist? Is that bird studies? I think that's bird studies. Uh, or is that insects? I, I never remember. But anyway, uh, you know, all the parts are properly labeled, right? That bird's got a crown, a nostril, a bill, lesser coverts. What the hell's that? Uh, greater coverts. What the hell's that? What's a covert? I don't know what that is. Tarsus, vent, vent. <laughs> All right. So, but this is what biology looks like to a physicist, right? There's some bird up there. It's got some, got some bird in the front. There's some bird on the back. There's lots of bird on that bird. Okay. So, so I'm, I'm warning you that I'm giving you examples that have physics embedded in them, but they're greatly simplified models of the real world. Okay. They're meant to make a point, but it's to illustrate that there is physics down there, you know, deep in the cell, uh, you know, lurking in the eyeball. There's physics everywhere. You have to tease it out in the sense that in order to just, like, solve problems with it, I do have to simplify things a little bit. Okay, so birds just made a bird. All right. So let's take a look at the cell membrane of a living cell. Right? If you could zoom in on a cell membrane right down to the atomic scale, or the molecular scale at least, you know, you'd have this nice bilipid membrane here separating a whole bunch of uh, ions on one side from a whole bunch of ions on the other. And so the job of the cell membrane is to be non-permeable to these ions, but allow them through with ion channels or pumps. All right, so there are structures embedded in the cell membrane that can be activated and deactivated and allow ions of different kinds to be moved in and out of the cell to main maintain or, uh, 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 equilibrium or create non-equilibrium situations that are necessary for life processes to proceed, okay? So you'll notice in this particular snapshot of a moment in the life of the cell wall, uh, there's a whole bunch of sodium ions outside, a little bit of potassium, uh, you know, lots of chlorine, and then inside you have some anions. So these are just, um, you know, uh, in this case, they have four minus charge, uh, four minus the elementary charge, uh, a whole bunch of potassium and uh, a little bit of chlorine, okay? And so you can imagine, well, I, you know, I've got charges in here. I've got, I've got potassium next to potassium. What are those two things going to do? Are they going to attract or repel each other? They're going to repel because they're the same charges, right? And you can see here, ah, but the potassium is attracted to the anions. It kind of bonds with them, right? So the, the anions will soak up the excess potassium here. And you can kind of see that that's the picture along the wall here. Okay, so you can already see in the, in the processes of basic chemical and biological phenomena, there's charge down there. And that's how anything sticks to anything else at the molecular level. It's all electric charge. Gravity doesn't do anything for you down there. It's way too small, OK? So let's build a physics problem off this that we can use to explore Coulomb's law. So here's a very simple problem involving some elements of the picture I just showed you, right? That's really, even that cartoon was fairly complicated. Let's boil this down to something ridiculously simple. So let's imagine I have an anion sitting here, a distance twice L, where L is given here, 2.8 times 10 to the minus 9 meters, 
from a potassium ion with a plus one elementary charge on it. And then up there, equally distant, but in the, uh, but in the y direction, so we can call that the x direction, we can call that the y direction, you've got a sodium ion, also with a positive one elementary charge. So negative four elementary charges, plus one elementary charge, plus one elementary charge. And again, the elementary charge is E, which is 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Okay? What we want to find out is what is the force, direction, and magnitude that the potassium ion, K, exerts on the sodium ion, all right, all the way up there. So there's K, there's an A, and we want to figure out what's the force that that exerts on that through its electric charge. Coulomb's law is the way we will figure that out. We will begin by making an assumption, and that assumption is that the potassium ion is very small compared to the dimensions of the problem, like L here. And that's probably true. I mean, I told you that you know, the radius of an atom is roughly an angstrom, 10 to the minus 10 meters. And this is you know, 10 times bigger than that, this distance. So that's probably not a bad approximation for this. All right. So for the problems we're going to do at the beginning, you, you should feel free to make that approximation. We're not going to break that approximation quite yet. All right, an approximation, does everybody know what an approximation is? If I say that word, does that make sense? Anyone not know what an approximation, when I say the word, make an approximation, does anybody not sure what that means in terms of the context of problem solving? It's basically making an educated guess. Okay, and it's okay to do that as long as you can justify it. All right, so we're going to make an approximation, we're going to make an educated guess, and we're going to assume that these are all basically point charges. So we can just use Coulomb's law. Okay, that's great, but what the hell does it mean to use Coulomb's law for this problem? Well, let's write Coulomb's law down. So I'm going to get rid of this stuff. And I'm going to try to work from left to right here. All right, Coulomb's law. The force that the potassium exerts on the sodium, so F vector with a subscript K comma Na, so I'll take that to mean the force that K exerts on Na, is equal to some constant of nature the charge of the potassium ion, the charge of the sodium ion, divided by the distance between the two of them squared. And then this whole thing is multiplied by this totally effed up funny looking thing up here with the hat on top of it, okay? The unit vector is often the most difficult part of these problems, okay? So I'll save it for last. When you are attacking a physics problem, the first thing to do is look at the problem and ask, what principles of nature could I apply to this? Okay? Well, it involves a question of force. So maybe I'll need F equals MA, although we've not been told anything is moving. So there's no A yet. So maybe we don't need that. This involves electric charge. Well, OK. These are small charges compared to the dimensions of the problem. So Coulomb's law should apply. So OK, I should probably apply Coulomb's law to this to answer the question. I've got charges. I've, I can figure out distances. And then I can get F. And I need to get direction and I need to get magnitude. OK, so, you, so what you want to do is start being able to look at a problem and think first, what physics ideas could be used to address the problem? Not all of them will be necessary, but think about it for a moment. The next thing you want to do is, because this is a problem that involves direction, you want to establish a system of coordinates in the picture. Now, I've done that for you here. I've implied, by drawing these dotted vertical and horizontal lines, that you could place the origin of the coordinate system sort of smack in the middle between the anion and the potassium ion, and the anion and the sodium ion in the vertical direction. Okay? But you could easily have put the origin of the coordinate system, this point, down here. So you can make this the y-axis and this the x-axis. It's sort of totally up to you what you want to do there. Okay? It does change potentially the numbers or the directions you'll get in the end. If you move the coordinate system around, positive can become negative and negative become positive. But it won't affect the physics of your solution in the end. All right. So I'm going to pick my coordinate system to be, I think, there. Um, let me see if that's what I did here just to simplify my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, why not? That works. Sure. Um, 
Okay, so let's pick the low-hanging fruit off this equation. Do I know k? Yeah, it's just a constant of nature. It's 8.99 times 10 to the 9 newton meters squared per coulomb squared. Done. I know that. Do I know qk? Do I know the charge of a potassium ion? Yeah, yeah, it's plus one times the elementary charge. Got that. Low-hanging fruit. Charge of the sodium ion? Yeah, same thing, in fact. Know that. What about the distance between the potassium ion and the sodium ion? Do I know this number, R? No, I don't. Not off the top of my head, but how could I figure it out? How could I figure out the distance between K and NA. Any ideas? Make a triangle. Make a triangle. Yeah, yeah. I can make a triangle, right? I mean, this is great because it already looks like one. It's got a, a base of length 2L and it's got a height of length 2L. And so it's a right triangle, which is nice. So I should just be able to use what to figure out the length? Pythagorean, Pythagorean theorem. Excellent. Yes. All right. So we're going to use the Pythagorean theorem to figure this out. And that just says, if I have a triangle like this with a right angle here, that c squared is equal to a squared plus b squared. That's it. You're going to get so much mileage out of this theorem in this course. Okay? So uh, a, in this case, is 2L. B is also 2L. So I square 2L, I square 2L, and I get... 4L squared plus 4L squared equals 8L squared. That's, <clears throat> that's the distance squared. Okay, so RKNA will be equal to the square root of 8L squared. I'm going to leave it like that for now. You could simplify it a bit more. You could say, well, I'll take the L squared out of the square root. Just put an L in front of the square root. You could do that. Uh, the square root of 8 is anybody know what that is off the top of your head? Two. Yeah, two root two, right? And you said a little less than, a little less than three. That's right. Why? Because the square of three is. Okay, good. Just checking. Just making sure we're good. All right. Yeah, it's a little less than three. And in fact, you can. Does anyone know what root two is off the top of their heads? One point four. Yeah, one point four, roughly. Yeah, one point four four. I think if you want to go one decimal place further. Yeah. So two times root two is two times one point four is two point eight eight, which is just slightly less than three. So it all checks, okay? Yeah, so using a little intuition like that, oh, it has to be less than three, because three squared is nine, right? But it's greater than two squared, which is four. Okay, so you should be able to guesstimate based on that. But I'm just gonna leave it like that for now. Okay, we're nearly there. We just have to figure out what this curious thing is over on the right, this so-called unit vector, r hat. Here's what we know about this unit vector. We know one thing about it right away. Oops. What's the one thing we know about the unit vector right away without doing any math whatsoever? What's that? It's equal to, what specifically about it? No, Lucy, right? Yeah, what specifically about it is equal to one? Yeah, magnitude, the length, yeah, exactly. Those words are interchangeable here, right? So what we know right away is that this, whatever this thing is, it's magnitude. If I put vertical bars around it, I mean magnitude. That it better be equal to one. That's a check. So we're going to figure out exactly what that is in our coordinate system using our numbers. But at the end of the day, it had better be true that the magnitude of that thing is 1. Does anyone know how to get the magnitude of a vector? Generically. If I gave you a vector a, how do you get its length mathematically? Square the components, add them together, and take the square root. Yeah, square the components, add them together, and take the square root. So I would take ax squared plus ay squared plus az squared, and I would take the square root of that. Okay, if it's only a two-dimensional vector, there is no z component, and I should put a square on that. That would be helpful, okay? All right, yeah, and in, and in vector mathematics notation, this thing is known as a dot a, the dot product of two vectors. Okay, so a dot a is each of its components squared and then added together. To get the length of a, which is written like this, you just take the square root 
of A dot A. Okay, so in compact vector notation, okay, we're exercising a little bit of this math language. That's how you write the magnitude of any generic vector. We'll call it A vector in this case. This is what you have to do, but that's what it looks like notationally. Okay? What if we wanted to get a unit vector that represented the direction of A and had magnitude of 1? Any idea how we would get that just generically from a vector A like this? How could we get an A hat, a unit vector that points in the direction that the vector A points but has a magnitude of 1? Any ideas? Sophie? Divide each of the components by its magnitude. Right. Yeah, divide basically the whole vector by its own length or divide each of the components by, its, by the total magnitude. So I could write this as AX in the I hat direction I don't know where that came from, plus AY, let's just do a two-dimensional vector for now. So I could write that vector A as AX I hat plus AY J hat, using that notation I showed you earlier. And if I divide that whole thing by the magnitude of A, okay, you can get something that has a magnitude of 1. Let me show you why. There we go. If I take A and I dot it into itself, take the dot product of a hat with itself, what do I do? Up top, I get the sum of the squares of the components. ax squared plus ay squared. Down here, I get the length of a squared. Okay? But what's the length of a? The length of a is the square root of AX squared plus AY squared. That's, that's the length of A. We just did that over here, right? Just a two-dimensional version of the same vector. So if I square that, if I square this, the square root goes away. AX squared, let's try that again, AX squared plus AY squared. So I get AX squared plus AY squared divided by AX squared plus AY squared, and that is equal to Wow, there's no confidence in the room on this one. <laughs> Practice this, okay? You should confidently be able to look at AX squared plus AY squared divided by itself is, anything divided by itself is one. Okay, so if I put it that way, you probably would have felt more assertive, right? I'm taking the thing up top and I'm dividing it by itself in the bottom. I have to get one. It's the only way that ever works out, okay? All right, so the only thing left to do here is to figure out what the unit vector is for our problem. Okay. I'm going to wipe this. Is that okay? Okay. It'll be in the YouTube video, and it'll be in my notes, which I'll post. So don't feel bad if uh, there was something up there that you didn't get written down. You can always pull it off the notes later. Okay? All right. Well, all we have to do to get r hat, I'm just going to write it without the subscript for now, is figure out what is r vector and divide it by its magnitude. So let's look at our coordinate system. We've got... Um, the force that the potassium ion is exerting on the sodium ion. So the convention, this is the one thing you're going to have to just memorize from Coulomb's law and use over and over and over again. This convention is going to come up all the time in Coulomb's law problems and related problems. The convention is that R hat starts on the source of the force and ends on the recipient, regardless of whether the force is attractive or repulsive. Let the charges tell you that. Just memorize this as a convention. You're going to start, when you have to figure out what r hat is, you've got to figure out the components of the r vector. And to do that, you're going to plant the origin of this vector on the charge that's acting on the other charge. So who's acting and who's the recipient of the force in this problem? K is acting. K is acting, right? So our vector, R, is going to start here and it's going to end up there. And it's going to have components. It's going to have a comp So that vector is going to point this way, right? So it's going to have a component along the negative x direction. It's going to have a, a component along the positive y direction. You don't even have to write down any math. 
just draw the arrow and you'll just look at it and go, okay, it's going to go left and it's going to go up. So negative x, positive y. Whatever the numbers are in front of those directions, that's what that vector is going to do. So our, our vector is going to go 2L to the left, 2L, negative I hat, and it's going to go 2L up, 2L J hat. Okay, and then I just need to know the magnitude of R, but I got that. I already did that. That work's done. It's just the square root of 8L squared. So r hat is just going to be equal to negative 2l i hat plus 2l j hat, all divided by the square root of 8l squared. You're almost done at this point, okay? You could simplify that a little bit. As I said, that could be simplified, but that's just an extra step, okay? But we've got it. We've, we've done it. We've got f vector, and we've got magnitudes and directions. We got k, we got q, we got the other q. We got that distance squared. We got r hat. We wrote it down based on that picture. We just have to plug in numbers and simplify, and we're good to go at this point. We're done. Okay? So that demonstrates this process of setting up and stepping through Coulomb's law problems. Your exercise, which we're out of time to do, is to calculate the total force on the, I believe it's on the anion. Let's see, I think I have it. Um, Yeah, what is the force that the potassium ion and the sodium ion together exert on the anion? That's the problem I was going to give you guys to do, but I spent too much time blathering. Again, that won't be a common thing I do in class. Mostly we'll just kind of get going with problem solving rather than having a little exposition. Okay? Do you guys have questions? Uh, I don't have any more office hours this week. I'm going to be traveling tomorrow. But, you know, you can make times to come and meet with me outside of office hours if the office hours aren't convenient. All right. Um, make sure you get homework zero into me, and that's a wrap for today. Is that okay. question due next class? It, it's not due. It's something you can just practice with, and I'll have the solutions up on the web page for you this afternoon. Okay? So try it out yourself from your notes, okay. and then see how far you can get, and then take a look at the solution. Okay? That's what I'd recommend doing. Oh, and if you have, like, uh, Coke cans and paper, could you bring that down to the front, please, so I can uh, put those back in the storeroom? Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Ah, excellent. Uh, that can just go there.